Hello, sorry for the slightly clickbaity title, but don't click off just yet. And before you go any further, none of this is as complex as it sounds, and most of these concepts are well over 30 years old. In this video, we're going to take a look at some very basic artificial intelligence, or AI, using neural networks. We're then going to learn how to evolve these using genetic algorithms so they can learn on their own. If you're not interested in the theory, then skip ahead to some really amazing demonstrations. The type of AI I'm showing in this video is only one of many different techniques available, but it's still very interesting. So let's get started. Before going any further, I just want to say thanks to my Patreons. If you'd like to be a Patreon, consider supporting me by following the links in the video description. So what is a neural network? Well, on the outside, it looks very much like a magic box. But when we open the box, we find loads of smaller circles, which we'll call a neuron. And we find that the inputs go into the input neurons, which then connect to one or more hidden layers of neurons. And finally, they combine together to produce the output. But how do they work? Let's take a look inside one of these neurons. At the basic level, and I'm skipping a fair amount of detail here, the neuron will look at all the inputs it has, add them up, pass them into some special kind of function called a threshold function or activation function, and then produce an output. The activation function could be something really simple, like if all the values added together are greater than a certain number, then output 1, alternatively output 0. In reality, something a little more complex is used, typically a sigmoid function. All you need to know about that is it produces a graph like this. And then we can forget about that and move on. Now when you combine several of these together, they all start performing the same function from the previous neuron. I've simplified the network here to help show this. While connected in this pattern, it won't produce any meaningful results, as right now all the inputs to every neuron are treated equal. This means that each neuron is identical and will produce the same output. But if we change the structure of the neuron, and give each input a different level of importance, a weight, and if each neuron input had a different weight, then the inputs can affect neurons in different ways within the network. That sounds great! So each neuron can cause a different output to other neurons by having different weight values. But how do we select these weights? This is where it gets interesting and a little bit complicated, and there's several ways this can be achieved. One of the most common ways is called backpropagation. Essentially, an input is presented to the network, which generates an output. The output is then compared to what it should be, and an error or loss is then calculated and then propagated backwards to adjust the weights at each level. This process is repeated several times until the output is produced correctly. But we're not going to use backpropagation. There's nothing wrong with it, and it can be very efficient when set up correctly. But we're going to look at a more interesting method. What if instead of feeding the output back in, we could produce several neural networks with random weight values, run them in a simulation, and then pick the best few. Well, we can. Enter the genetic algorithm. The idea behind the genetic algorithm comes from nature. Suppose we have two parents, each with their own DNA. DNA being made up of chromosomes. To produce a child, the chromosomes from the two parents are randomly merged. Now, if this is all that happened, then the population would never diverge from the differences between the parents. So it turns out there's one more detail. Sometimes, when these chromosomes are merged, one may get damaged or mutate into an entirely different chromosome. This only happens a tiny amount, but enough so that over many generations new characteristics may arise. We can apply this technique to neural networks like this. First, we score each of our networks in our simulation. We call this a fitness value. We then sort them based on this fitness. Then, we can optionally choose to take the top few to automatically be cloned and used in the next generation. We'll call these the alphas. Then, we produce an algorithm that randomly picks one of these parent networks. This algorithm should bias towards the best fitness score, which could be the highest or the lowest depending on how you set it up. Once we have this algorithm, we use it to pick two parents. Then we extract their weight values and combine them to make two children. There are several methods that can be used here, and these methods are called crossover functions. So for example, we could generate a new list of weights by randomly picking them from the parents. Variations of this are called uniform crossovers. We could also pick a random position, and anything above that position could come from parent 1, and below from parent 2. This is called a one-point crossover or single-point crossover. Now, after combining into a new list, we randomly modify a small number of them by a small amount. 
And that's the mutation, and without this, the network couldn't learn new things. Then we repeat this process, randomly selecting parents, until we have a new population of neural networks. Now I know this sounds a little crazy, and it does sound like the infinite number of monkeys, with an infinite amount of time, typing out the entire works of Shakespeare, but this method does actually work. Because it's totally random though, this could take 10 generations, 100, 1000, and it might be different every single time, and the results you get will also be different. There is another thing we could explore, but maybe we'll save that for another video, and that's to not just mutate the weights, but also the shape of the network, adding more layers or removing or adding neurons. But I think that's enough for now, so let's see it in action. What you can see now is a strange simulation I've created to demonstrate this. In this first experiment, our network has a very simple design. The concept is that we have a world with a population of robots that need to stay alive. They do this by collecting batteries from the world, and when they collect one, it bumps up their energy level. If they run out of energy, they die. We then score each robot for fitness based on how long they survived and how much power they had left, and we'll run this simulation 6,000 times. After that, or if they all die, we'll use genetic algorithms to create a new generation. The neural network I'm using has 5 inputs, 2 outputs, and 2 hidden layers containing 14 and 12 neurons. Input 1 and 2 are a directional vector showing which way the robot moved last time. Input 3 and 4 are a directional vector showing the direction to the nearest battery. And input number 5 is a percentage of the amount of power they have left. I'll take their outputs, subtract one from the other, and use that as an amount to rotate the robot with limits, and then combined as a speed. Now each network is set up with totally random weights, and the thing to get your head around is they have no understanding of what those inputs mean, or any understanding of how they should use that to control their output. So for the first generation, those inputs and outputs are totally meaningless. Now if we take a look at the simulation, you can see a variety of things going on. Remember, right now, this is all based on a totally randomly wired brain. The red dots are the batteries. The dotted lines are purely for our benefit, so we can see which is the nearest battery for each robot. If any of the robots do manage to collect a battery source, then it's probably random look at this stage. You may even see some just going round and round in circles. The section in the middle of the screen shows you how much power is available for each robot, and the section on the right will be used to show a graph as each generation finishes. In this design, I'm keeping the best four networks from each generation and automatically putting them back into the next round. This helps to ensure any useful knowledge doesn't get accidentally mutated out. The code for this application is available in the video description if you want to play with this. There's also a link to an HTML5 version of this I wrote several years ago. The code is designed for readability and not necessarily efficiency. With such a small population, it's hard to optimise for. For much larger models, you'd probably use an existing library, and maybe use the graphics card to accelerate the processing. Whilst it's fascinating watching these, we'd be sitting here for hours at this speed, so we'll increase the speed and let it go a bit faster. It's still going to take too long like this. So instead of running the simulation in the way we can see it, we'll get it to output it every time a generation finishes. Now all we can see is just the results. You can see on the right this is slowly being graphed for us. The line at the bottom is the number of robots that survived all 6,000 steps. The green line is the average fitness score, and the purple represents the age of the oldest survivor. As we continue to watch the simulation, we can see that not much is changing every generation. But if we leave it long enough, we should start to see an upward curve in the average fitness, the number of survivors, and the age of the oldest survivor. I'm going to speed the video up a little bit so you don't have to wait so long. There we go, something's starting to happen. I'll slow it down so we can take a look. Well that doesn't look particularly clever, so let's carry on. Let's have a look now. Some improvement, but let's leave it a little longer. So now we seem to be approaching the top of the curve, so I'm going to slow it down and have another look. Okay, they seem to be reasonably good at hunting down the batteries, but there's some very erratic movement going on. I'm going to leave this a little bit longer and see if that improves. Hmm, that's an improvement, but maybe we should try a little bit longer. Okay, I would say they're pretty optimised now. They're literally swarming each battery as they see it. That's absolutely incredible that they've learned that without me having to do anything. Did I just create life? We'll leave that to the philosophers to decide. Okay, let's try a different simulation. In this simulation, I've added a second source of power. The theory is that both the two types need to be collected, and if either runs out, the robot will die. 
The second one, however, doesn't disappear when it's collected. But if they stay there too long, the battery power will run out. So they need to decide which resource to go after. I've changed the network to look like this. All I've done is added a second direction to the nearest patch of sunlight and a value showing how much they've collected. Both will be depleted at the same speed, but sunlight is collected much more slowly. I'll speed this up again like before. With a more complex input, I expect them to take longer to learn. Once again, these have been set up with totally random brains, so we'll run this until something starts to happen. Ok, well there's something going on on the curve, it's not quite like before, so let's take a look. Well they seem to be just targeting anything. Let's continue and see what happens. Ok, the oldest survivor is starting to go a bit crazy, so let's take a look. Well it seems they've learned how to collect both resources, but I'm not sure if they're able to prioritise. So let's leave it a bit longer and see what happens. Ok, so something different is happening here. They've definitely learned the sunspots they stay on to collect the energy, whereas batteries they just pass by. I'm still not sure if they're able to prioritise. It could be that our neural network isn't complicated enough to allow it to make the decisions that we're asking for. I thought I'd leave this simulation running a long, long time and see what happens. There's some improvements. I mean, it's not brilliant, but it's a lot better. This'll do for now. Let's try another problem. So this time, they only have to collect batteries again. However, the orange section is made of quicksand, and if they move over it, they slow down to a quarter of their normal speed, and therefore their battery gets depleted much quicker. This time I've changed the network like this. We'll tell it the direction the nearest sandpit is, and if they're actually standing on the sandpit or not. If they are, we'll set this input as 1, if not, we'll set it to 0. And remember, to start with, all those numbers are totally random and meaningless, as you can see. Let's speed this up again and see what happens. There's obviously some intelligence gained, but it's not very useful, so let's wait a little longer. That's a bit more like it, although I still reckon there's room for improvement. And now as the curve is almost flat, you can see they're actually being really clever and mostly avoiding the orange area. Self-preservation, maybe it is life. Let's move on to our final problem. This one's a little different, and I don't know if their brain capacity is correct. So in this final one, I'm going to allow each robot to project a shield around a battery, ensuring only they can collect it. They can power the shield if their battery reserve is at least a third full. If another robot runs over the spot, they'll ignore it and move on. However, this comes with a penalty. Turning on the shield uses robot power up at a much higher rate. My hope is they'll learn to selectively use it. I've gone back to seven inputs this time, the two new ones being if the battery nearest to them is actually being targeted by another robot, and the second being if the last step they had the shield turned on. One important other note is that while the shield is active, the other robots can't even see the battery so will no longer be targeting it. To make this more interesting, I've also decreased the number of batteries available. On the output, however, I've added two extra outputs. If the difference between them is positive, we'll attempt to shield the battery if it's not being shielded by any other robot, and if negative, we'll deactivate the shield. So let's have a look. At this stage, it looks much like the first simulation as none of them have enough power to run the shield. I'm hoping they'll quickly learn to collect the batteries and then use the shield. I suspect there'll be a point where switching on the shield will be a disadvantage because they haven't learned to collect the batteries efficiently enough. I'm going to speed this up now and we'll watch. Ok, it looks like we've reached the first level of intelligence where they know how to collect the batteries. So let's watch a little further. Ok, they've just got better at collecting batteries, so let's leave it a little longer. Did I just see a shield? Interesting. Ok, so we're starting to see the shields being used now. I can't really tell if they're being used correctly, so let's watch a little bit further. This looks like as far as it's probably going to train. It's interesting watching them. I'm not sure whether they're switching on the shield to prevent other robots collecting the batteries, or whether to make sure that they collect it. Did we just invent greed? 
fascinating. I suspect that if we were to increase the complexity of the brain, it could probably learn to do this much more efficiently. But that's enough for this demonstration. Neural networks sure are crazy, but very interesting. And genetic algorithms are mad too. Real world usage for these applications is this right now. On the neural network side, there's already so many uses, and I'm sure you constantly hear the letters AI buzzing around all the time. Most of these are just trained models that are retrained on fixed data, and aren't using genetic algorithms to mutate them. Don't worry, we haven't created Skynet. This whole subject of artificial intelligence continues to advance as hardware evolves and become more and more complex. I still believe we're only just starting to explore the possibilities. If you'd like to learn more about AI, then I can strongly recommend a series called Artificial Intelligence from MIT that you can watch on YouTube. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and why not head over to my Patreon to support me in creating new content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.